Yeah. No way. Dude, no, no way. way. No way. Did you guys we, get we, that deal? Walk, yeah, he walked into we were, our deal and we were, our we were negotiating with her and you were the higher bidder. All right, guys. Welcome back to the Nia Genius Podcast. My name is Josh. I'm the host for today. I'm here with... My name is Jesse. I'm the co-host for the day. And we have Bob Wharton on. He's a Delaware local. Bob, would you mind telling the people back at home a little bit about What's what up? you do? It's War Burton, though. That's how you Come pronounce on, it. Come on, bro. War, Bur- <laughs> War Burton. War right. Burton. <laughs> it's a tough name to War pronounce. Burton? Just break okay. it up into two words. War and Burton, like Richard Burton. Uh, you young guys will never know who that was. Old actor back way back when. Nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me up here. This is a cool setup you guys got here. Well, thanks, man. We really appreciate you coming out here. I don't know how far of a drive. Was it like 15 minutes uh, down the road? Yeah, it just took 12 minutes, it said. I, I'm minutes, right in. My road. office is right in uh, the heart of Wilmington, Trolley Square. Um, so it's just right up right up 95, real close. Nice. We're just like neighbors. Yeah. 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 So you wholesale, you buy and hold. Do you flip at all? Yes, I do. You do? We just bought a, a fix and flip property on Friday on Marsh Road. I've got about three projects within walking distance of here. On Marsh Road, which is, I don't know, maybe a mile or two away. And um, I have two f- properties where, f- I guess you would call them burrs, where we're, we're going to fix them up and rent them. Okay. Um, so I used to do a whole lot more fix and flips. I've kind of scaled back on that with the advancement of wholesaling. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I personally want to keep my hands involved in fix and flips. I think it's good because it keeps me, um, educated on, you know, we're seeing prices go up for labor, for materials. So I think it really keeps me, um, you know, a better expert as far as what things cost, Mm -hmm. timelines, how to deal with contractors, um, so, and I, uh, I partner up with some people and, you know, we do the fix and flips together. So I think it just makes me more well-rounded, okay. but you know, the whole, and it's fun to see a product go from ugly to finished. Um, but, um, you know, the, the wholesaling and the fix and flip is my today money, my W2 money to fund me to keep the lights on, put the gas in a car, but the ultimate goal is to take that for, you know, into my buy and hold, which is my mm-hmm. long-term money. Hey, Bob, can you tell us a little bit about, about your origin story? Tell us about, like, what were you doing prior to real estate? What were you doing prior to that? And then, you know, tell us about how you got into real estate. Wow, I'm a superhero. I got an origin story. <laughs> yeah. Origin story. Your <laughs> humble beginnings. Um, I, you know, what's funny is my favorite game as a kid, board game, board game kids are, are what you do when you're not on your computer nowadays. Uh, was Monopoly. And I loved playing Monopoly as a kid. And that was just, you know, we were down the beach. We, my parents had a beach house and we were always down there and all the neighborhood kids, we'd play Monopoly. And these games would last for hours. We'd break. Time to come home for dinner. All right, we'll pick it up tomorrow. And eventually the other people were like, I don't want to play anymore. I'm like, no, 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 we got to keep playing. So in case you haven't seen Monopoly, it's a game of buy and hold. You buy, you you, then you buy three properties, then you can put houses on it, then you can put hotels on it. And little did I know that's eventually what I wanted to do. Now, I didn't, you know, I went to college, I was a business major. And, you know, at the time, Wall Street was coming out and finance was huge. So, you know, I was looking into that. I got into medical sales and was in sales for, for a long time, um, uh, making really good money and, you know, but I was wearing a suit. I thought that was the ultimate goal was to wear a suit, you know, and uh, go to hospitals. I thought that was super prestigious. Um, I did buy um, my first rent, my first property, which I still own to this day in Wilmington, Delaware. And, I, um, you know, I lived in it and eventually bought more properties. But I kind of t- I stopped. I bought another one or two properties. And unfortunately, I stopped doing any real estate for about a good 10 years or so. Um, and then. I think I saw like an infomercial of Robert Allen or uh, Robert Kiyosaki and got, got back into it, went to another event, and then really started getting into pre-foreclosures right before the foreclosure crisis back in, starting in like 04, 05, 06, we are doing pre-foreclosures and then transitioning into short sales when the market crashed. And um, I, I quit my job in 06, I was doing, like I said, medical sales, and um, I was doing really well with that, but I just really, my heart wasn't in it anymore. And 
told my boss, you know, he's like, what's going on? You know, I could tell you've lost your, your vigor and your excitement for our job. And I just said, listen, I've always had this goal to have my own company and do real estate full time. So that's kind of my, how I got started and been doing it full time ever since then. Um, it was crazy that to, to, you know, Oh six was good. Oh seven was good. And then everything fell off the world, you know, off a cliff in 08. But I'm glad I did that. I remember some lean years from 08 and 09 because if I didn't, it would have just pushed me back another couple of years. And I might, I'm, who knows, I might not have ever taken the, the leap seeing that, that the foreclosure crisis. But, you know, I'm glad I, I did it then. But uh, that's, that's kind of how I got started. So when you took that leap, did you have like a safety net or did you have enough properties to cover your um i was i only had two rentals at the time so no they weren't making me any money i mean a couple hundred bucks but you know with repairs and stuff that they were basically you know barely breaking even um no i was doing deals on the side since i was a salesperson i wasn't uh, you know clocking in nine to five so i had flexibility to do stuff on the side and i was starting to do deals and I saw that if I could dedicate myself, I could meet my other, you know, salary and exceed that. Hmm. Um, but I mean, you know, I'm always leery of people that are like, they haven't done a deal and they they want to quit their job. I'm like, you know, you really, I mean, the goal is you're supposed to have six months in the bank. I did not have that. Um, but another thing, if you've got a job with benefits, I mean, I had healthcare, which is a big deal, especially now of expensive healthcare is, so I'd be leery. I mean, you could do this as a side hustle. Um, and really, you know, before you quit, um, especially if you have a family and, you know, you can do this as a side hustle. I'm not going to knock anybody that burns the bridges and go, quits right away, but I think you can, I'm a little bit more conservative that way. I think you can grow into it. And then when you, you know, have some, some success that you know, that can be reproduced. Cause I, I see some people do a great deal and they're like, all right, that's it. And then they go through a dry spell and, you know, and then they're eating ramen noodles for a couple of months. So, um, you know, that's just my, my opinion. I think you should, you know, build it up before you quit your job. Yeah. I feel the same exact type of way. And I tell people the same thing, but I'm also one of those people who left my job with not six months of reserves. Yeah. And it was just like, do as I say, not as I do, unless you feel super convicted to go do it and you won't stop until the end of the earth to go make this thing happen for you. And you're not going to sleep. And you're going to work 18 hour days and maybe you'll sleep for six hours and you get back to the grind. Unless you're going to do that, don't leave your job with no reserves. But can you talk to us a little bit about what did your run look like prior to 2008? Like what did you accumulate? What have you done? And then how did 2008 affect you? Well, we were doing, um, I was, you know, one man show basically. I didn't have, you know, it was before the term virtual assistant was thought of. I mean, I didn't even... I didn't even have an entity. I was just a sole practitioner. Um, you know, so I was primarily, um, before cold calling was eventing, before texting was, you know, really even a thing. Um, so the number one lead source was direct mail. It was banded signs. We talked about that earlier. Um, you know, networking refer referring wasn't really even vented yet. There were no RIAs. Uh, there was no YouTube. There was no internet when I started. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was old school methods, which still work today, believe it or not. Direct mail still works, you know, bandit signs still work. I mean, you can't scale that. It's very difficult. Um, but that's what we were doing. We were, um, I was niche marketing to pre for, or to the, um, pre foreclosure lists. We were able to, we used to physically go down to the courthouse in Wilmington and, you know, write down the information, you know, the, the file number, the person's, uh, name their address and then we would mail to them and they would call us back and 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 try to work with them and started doing short sales when their equity went away um uh, i didn't have a lot of money we were trying to do mostly fix and flips i did some deals subject to where we took over their debt fixed it fixed up the house sold it and paid off their debt so i wasn't really keeping a lot of properties it was just I needed, since I quit, I needed, I wasn't worried about my future. I was like, I need money today to live. Um, that's one of the reasons why if you have a job, I think you could, you can afford to buy some properties and buy and hold them, mm -hmm. keep them from the long term. They don't have to make money. You, you could, 
you know, look for a future appreciation and um, in a good area, it's more important. You don't need to make money off of them right away. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the market back then. It was, it's in a sense, a lot easier. There's so much more. We talked about this earlier, so much more free education out there, you know, podcasts and stuff like this that you can learn from. So it was a little bit different back in those days. So did you have like a mentor or did you find a book? Um, what were you doing? the very first event, it was Robert G. Allen. And this, this guy was one of the original guys, you know, he had this book, no money down. And it was such a great title. Um, you know, he would, he is the whole premise was like, he was interviewed by the LA times where he, and a, a, a reporter went with him and it was like, he had a hundred dollars in his pocket, you know, couldn't use a credit card, couldn't do anything. And they like dropped him in a city and this reporter went with him and he had to buy a house within, I forget what it was, a weekend or something like that. And he was huge on creative, creative terms, you know, no money down. That was the whole premise. No money down, getting a property. And it was, I mean, back then it was, you know, calling up the for sale by owner in the newspaper, calling up the for rent signs. Um, so, you know, he was the original guy I worked with. Um, then, um, uh, Ron Legrand, who's another um, original guy, way back when he's still kicking down in Jacksonville, and he, you know, he 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 really was one of the um, forefathers as far as uh, real estate investing, wholesaling, fix and flip, buy and hold. Um, and another gentleman named Jeff Collar, who was a student of Ron's, but he really specialized in the pre foreclosure, and that was uh, I I really worked with him for years, joining his mentorships mastermind groups and that was really my sole niche was just the pre-foreclosure market so how can anybody buy a house with no money down like you, you drop off this guy in the middle of the city say we drop you off in the middle middle of wilmington and we give you, <laughs> we give you like a solid week and we give you maybe a room inside like a crack house and <laughs> that's then, what he did yeah, yeah so and like some ramen yeah we give you some ramen yeah and it's like how can you get a door that and it's funny is because that's what he did and, and there was no cell phones back this is in the 90s mm. might have been the 80s so he had to convert some of his money to quarters to go to a pay phone to make phone calls um i mean today um i mean sure you could i mean i buy houses the house i just uh bought on friday that's going to be a fix and flip it was no money down i didn't use a penny of my tell own us money. about that deal yeah. give us give us the rundown what sure um you know what? That is absolutely, truly no money down. When people say, oh, no money down. Oh, we need money for marketing. I didn't even spend any money on marketing on that deal. I was looking at another property. Um, I forget how that came about. It might have been from direct mail or cold caller. And then right across the street, I saw an estate sale sign. And um, so after I finished my appointment, I literally walked across the street and they were selling. Uh, what well, actually it wasn't a estate sale. It was a yard sale sign. And they were selling. They they had had on their out of their house. They had a shop next door that sold doll um, dresses for dolls, which I didn't even know was a thing. I mean, you could buy dresses for your dolls, I guess. So I walk up and they're like, "Hey, do you you know, do you want these for your daughters?" And I'm like, I, "I don't have any daughters, but you know, just building rapport." And by the way, are you thinking about selling the house? Yeah, yes, we are. So you know, just right then and there, this is my, you know, this is my mother. She's going to be selling. She's moving into a, um, she's going to buy a mobile home. So I toured it, took a wait, video. Wait, what was that street? Dude, I think that was a, that was a deal we missed. That was a deal. We yeah. Missed. What, what was the street? Marsh road? No way. Wait, was there like right next to the plaza, right next to the shopping center? Not far. Was, are there like townhouses? Like just to the right of it. Well, it had and, a doll. It had a doll store attached to it. To the right of it. Yeah. And it was like all pink, and there was a there was a wheelchair elevator in there. Yeah. No way, <laughs> dude. No, no way. way. No way. Did you guys get we, that we, deal? We, yeah, we walked into we were, our deal. And we, were, we, were our lunch. we were negotiating with her, and you were the higher bidder. Okay, no, no go on with your story. Sorry. You, he's, he's just salty because he was the acquisition guy. See, learn, that, learn, yeah, that was learn like, from the master. I lost that deal because, yeah. We are, we'll talk about why you lost it later. Well, she told me why you lost it. We'll we'll, we'll talk so about let's go, that let's later. Let's go. Uh, yeah. So I didn't even um, I didn't even market to that. I just happened to see the sign, and I think driving what we call driving for dollars is a great way if you're just getting started. Um, 
you know, because I didn't, like I said, I didn't even spend any marketing. I just saw that. I was literally looking at this house, looked across the street, saw a yard sale sign. So, I mean, that was truly no money down. I just walked across the street, uh, took a took a look, met the people, and because I, I wasn't even prepared, so I didn't run any comps, went home, and um, and then we we locked up the deal. But um, so you know, to answer your question, can you do that? Yes. Now, so I didn't spend any money on marketing. Plus, um, we have we're going to keep that as a fix and flip. Um, and I have private lenders that fund the purchase price, the closing costs, and uh, all of the rehab costs. So 100% uh, funded. I don't come out of pocket at all. So that's truly a no money down, no marketing. And um, we're funded, a private lender funds the whole transaction. No payments during the uh, flip process. They get paid on the back end on the HUD when it's done. So Sure, you can do that all the time, all day long. Tell us about why Josh lost a deal. <laughs> tell us, tell us I mean, what, I, what I, did I, you do. I know why I lost a deal. What? What did? Okay, explain. Go ahead. You explain what, what so happened. I just didn't follow up. Follow up enough. We Kenny Kenny gave him a price, which I like. I don't know why he didn't start. He started really low, mm-hmm. so he gave him a price, and she was kind of upset about it. And then she was like, "Hey, we're looking at other options." So I was like, "All right." So then. I called her like a week later when it should have been like three days later. Yeah. And by that time she was like, we accepted another offer and okay. follow up is key. How does it, how did it play out on your end? Um, I, you know, I would have presented an offer right then and there, but like I said, I wasn't prepared. I just, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't know any of the comps. So, you know, I went home and did my repair costs, ran the comps and was back in touch with her, but gave her an offer. And, and she, she flat out told me, I, thought that you know she felt that i took the time to build rapport with her and she said regardless if you were less or more you were about even with a couple people she said i wanted to and you'll if you go to my ig you'll see the uh, testimonial to be up there really yeah it's it's coming so you know you win some you lose some i lost the one on the house that i originally went to um you know, I lost that one. So, I mean, it's a numbers game. You can't let, let one get down. I lost that one. I mean, I lose, you know, I lost two to realtors yesterday. This was kind of a bummer, but you know, it's a numbers game. You know, I always talk to my mentors. I'm like, well, what would you do with this? And they say, it's just a matter of, you don't have enough leads. That's the thing. I mean, you want to have so many leads that this just, you know, falls off your back, like water off a duck, you know, so try to learn from your mistakes. Um, but you know, there's that, that's just the beauty. I mean, there's, you know, we're not, I don't feel we're in competition. I mean, no. I'm going to get that one. You'll get the next yeah. one, you know, and move on from there. But sometimes people click with you. You never know something. They might like something and you just got to get out there and make offers. Talk, as Brett Daniels says, TTP, talk to people. So yeah, that's yeah. the one we're going to keep as a flip. So yeah. Some people will love Kenny's personality and some people will love your personality or hate the other or feel more comfortable with this person because you have this background, you went to this high school. It's all about yeah. what can you bring up in that conversation and building a rapport. A lot of the sales process is more so how can you build that relationship, have them act more on emotion and work with you because at the end of the day, we're buying houses, but it's more of like we're selling our company to sure, them. Sure, sure. Right? Some people like a big company and I was like, I would be like, Oh, I want to work with a big brand name company. Some people want to work with a mom and pop, you know, that's why there used to be in mar- direct mail. It used to be what was called a yellow letter, which was like ripped off of a legal pad and it was red ink. It was just like very homespun, like, Hey, I'm in the area. Me and my wife want to buy you the house. And, and that was the, and that attracted a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And some people were, it's branded with your logo and, your Better Business Bureau and your, you know, all your referrals and some people are attracted to that. Um, I think it's also how well you show that you can close too. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that's important too. You, you know, the, you, you exude confidence that you can solve their problem. I mean, I've heard statistics that, you know, only maybe one or two percent, maybe 5% of the people out there were a fit for, I mean, most people don't need our services. They yeah. they can list with a realtor, and 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 that's what I say. You know, sometimes have you thought about listing with a realtor? Do you really need me? You know, your house is in excellent shape. You're not behind on your mortgage. You live in the house. You you don't need to sell tomorrow. 
your taxes or, you know, what, how can I solve your problem? And, and if I can't, then what's the point? You know, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Let's get you hooked up with a good realtor in the area who can get you the most for your house. We're here, you know, for people that look for speed, convenience, and peace of mind. They need to move quickly and they need for us to solve a problem that they have. So that's one of the things I love about this is coming up with creative solutions for people to, to solve their problems where just listing it with a realtor won't work, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you talk to us about how your business has kind of adapted over the time? Because I know before, yeah offer a lot of cash offers i'm not sure if you've always been like earlier in your career offering a lot of cash offers and sometimes you do the occasional subject too but then i heard from you last month that you're doing innovations nowadays and that's kind of like a new thing in like the last two years can you talk about how your creative strategies have kind of adjusted yeah from time to now yeah i mean yeah was always you know um cash cash offers were were the most popular you know that's the, the old bandit signs we buy houses cash fast i mean that was the whole thing but um a lot of times you know you're going to run into a million people that might not solve their issue they're more interested in getting a set price for example and they don't need the money today you know wh- you know finding out what they're going to do with the money and then you know sometimes there's tax implications where if they get a huge chunk of change it could boost them into a higher tax bracket so that could be a problem for them. And they realize they would rather, you know, a lot of times with tired landlords that, you know, they like the steady income. They just don't want to deal with the two T's, you know, toilets and tenants anymore. But they like that mailbox money, you know, of <laughs> although we don't get any more, we, we get everything ACH now, we don't get any more checks in the mail. But that old term ma- mailbox money, they still like getting, you know, a check in the mail. But, you know, can we, you know, so... Th- they'll be more willing to do seller financing or if they're in default and they're facing foreclosure, they might consider selling subject to where we take over their payments. Um, we did innovations before it wasn't even a term. Um, we just called it a partnership. Innovation from what I've learned is, you know, removing, you know, paying someone a fee to cancel your agreement so the someone can step into your place basically. And that's what a innovation agreement is. Um, we were doing, you know, more of a partnership with the seller, like where, you know, we're 20 grand apart. If we don't actually buy the house, you know, we'll save on transfer taxes, which are obscene in Delaware when you buy and when you sell, you know, all sorts of other cost of money fees. So we can save on that if we can work together. And we were doing renovation partnerships or renovation innovations, um, so we would renovate it. They, we would agree to a, a bottom line price. Mm-hmm. We can get you what you want, but you're just going to have to wait a couple months. So, you know, finding out when they want to get paid, you know, the price is more important than the time. And that's where creative or innovations work. Uh, you know, so if you can wait three months, we're going to renovate it. We'll put it on the market and we'll get you your price. Um, so, yeah, just, you know. Uh, you just got to stay current and see what what new things are out there to try to solve the problems. Because if you just have one strategy, you're going to miss a lot of deals or, you know, there's a lot of things you can do out there. So, yeah. yeah. Have you ever done it as is novation? You know, no. And that's the, that's the big thing now. And I'm working on that. Um, it should be interesting. Uh, uh, you know, to overcome that as far as sales process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I know people, I know some really big hitters are doing that and, um, you got to find the right person who's okay with you putting it on the MLS and then seeing your, your fee at the closing at the end. And they're okay with, well, why didn't they just list it themselves? Why are, why are they doing it with you? So I have yet to do that, but I know people that are doing it. So yeah. I think it's a good strategy. We're we're working on that. So I just haven't closed one yet. Yeah. We're trying to execute on a couple of those and we're pitching it to the sellers and telling them, so we are going to market your property publicly on the MLS, but we also have our exclusive buyers list. But the catch with working with us is that you don't need to work with any of the FHA or conventional appraisal requirements when they want you to fix anything. If anything comes back, we'll take care of it. 100%. We will take care of it. And because I like how you pitched like 
a partnership idea. Yeah. I, I never heard of that. So because we are partners, I guess we could use that in our script now. Yeah, sure. So it's just like, because we are partners, we can use our costs when it comes to construction because we do it at such a large scale. And we're able to make a fee, but we're also paying the we're also paying the commissions off that top line price. When we promise you a price, that's gonna go towards Jeanette. you and your payoff. So anything that comes with the spread, that's going to paying the transfer taxes, paying the mm -hmm. realtor commissions, and then paying for any of the renovations that we have to do. Anything that is left over, that's for us for helping coordinate the entire transaction. So you're not gonna need to talk to title you're not going to need mm -hmm. to talk to insurance agents not going to need to talk to anybody you know buyers we will handle the entire process for you and all you need to worry about is signing a couple of documents and we'll tell you on a weekly basis keep you updated on the process i think the reason why novations work is because of the communication process like i talked to some of my mentors and they're like yeah we got to follow up with these people whether they're a novation or whether they are a cash buyer lead or cash seller lead the more you follow up and tell them about what's going on what kind of offers are they getting in the process i feel like the better the rapport is yeah. so when you do ever come in and ask for a price reduction because like the market's doing this they trust you because you've been diligently working and you tell them transparently i'm going to list your house on the market we're going to try to collect the offers and your house currently right now it's going to get red flagged for FHA repairs. Yeah. What do you do? And that's key. Transparency, continued follow-up. Yeah. You built the rapport. They trust you. Yeah. And then you trust them too. It's got to be, you know, if you've got a They're going to sign. About, you got to hope that they sign. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I for us, it's an absolute paramount that the house is vacant. Yeah. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because if someone's living in the house and, you know, especially much. if we do repairs and stuff and- yeah. And they're like seeing all these showings. They'll be like, why don't I just list it myself? What? So that was my concern about the punch list, which always occurs. I mean, yeah. these home inspectors, they're they're always going to come up with something to justify why you paid for a home inspection. Um, so you're saying you're going to pay for that out of your pocket? Or? We're paying for the FHA required items. Okay. So that usually only totals up to $1,000, $2,000. Okay. So we underwrite for that. And if we think it's going to be more based off of our experience and what FHA has given us in the past, yeah. we underwrite for that in our price. And we, you know, we justify a $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 fee. And another thing is also, you say that you have to, you may be worried about them not signing the documents. Well, if this is a real partnership and you present to them the legal power of attorney, limited power of attorney. You just tell them this is just for this house. This is for us to order the payoff. Yeah. In, in the instance that anything does go wrong, like whether you're in the hospital or whether your your phone goes out and we can't get a hold of you, like we're going to still have this agreement. So the money is still going to come to you. They're always going to cut this check no matter what. Sure. So we're still going to be able to go, with the go through with the transaction and close it. Your payoff will be 100% satisfied and then you're going to get the mm -hmm. difference no matter what. So as long as you're 100% okay with doing this type of transaction, like this is what we'll need from you. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you can go to the closing table if that's how you feel is best for you, but Yeah. Have you done one where you've closed? We've always had the seller, you know, the sellers, we're just getting paid as a line item um on page 2 as as a fee. Um mm -hmm. We're in Delaware or even Pennsylvania where the closing attorneys is, is okay, even with the power of attorney as you, you signing. And, and more importantly, the closing attorney is okay and the title company is okay. But, you know, what we're mostly dealing with is, you know, cash deals where you're sell if you're wholesaling, mm -hmm. you know, your buyer doesn't care. But if you're now you're dealing with Wells Fargo and are they going to be okay with that, you know, sh seeing someone who's not uh, signing, but that's worked out okay. So we're currently working on one right now. And what was kind of ter terrible about that transaction initially was because the whole market turned. We had it under contract for 305. We listed it for 290. They canceled the day before settlement because it was contingent upon them selling their house. And the buyer for their house was short $8,000. I was like, you could have told us this like two weeks ago. Yeah. And then because that had happened and we had offered to 
you know, make that transaction close because that's fifteen thousand dollar difference. We'll just give you eight grand. You close. Maybe you can give us like yeah. you know three hundred dollars a month for whatever time, and then they close. You close, and then we get paid out. That deal died. <laughs> Yeah, and then we got under contract for list price, so we yeah. lost that fifteen thousand dollar spread, and then we went to the we spent another six weeks under contract. So, I mean, we haven't had any issues. We have two weeks left until closing, but for work. that for that transaction that was about to close, no one said anything. Yeah, and the attorneys had said, "Yeah, everything looks good to us. You got everything clearly documented. We didn't run an ovation. We had run." Um, an addendum to the agreement of sale. So I guess that, so yeah. there's many ways in which kind of like you can know yeah, they, sure. yeah. I guess, you know, you were saying you're cut and that's, an, that's, that's a new little twist. You just taught me right now is, um, you know, Mr. S Mr. Mrs. Seller, I'm going to cover all FHA required repairs. Um, I think what that would, that what, what went off in my mind is you better do a, we better do a better, um, uh, inspection on the front end. Um, yeah. because what's, you know, you know, the thing that we never look in is the chimney. Mm -hmm. and if you're doing yep. a fix and flip, you've got the budget for it. You're going to pay for it. <laughs> but you know, that, you the know, chimney things, lining, that's, came up. that's going to come up. Yeah. You got to real, you know, maybe get someone up there to look at that before you agree to this. Uh -huh. Cause that could be, you know, several thousand, uh, the fireplace, you know, foundational stuff, water in the basement, mm -hmm. you know, make sure, you know, um, so what we, what the way we did it was, we agree to do, and we do a scope of work that they agree to, and then they sign a um, contractor agreement, and they agree to this price, and we mark it up, basically, you know, to, to include our profit. So if they ever backed out, we have a notarized um, scope of work. Uh, we could file a mechanics lien if they don't okay. do it, because because we're coming out of pocket for the yeah. rest. And what we tell them is, once we get to closing. Uh, if things do come up, we'll address that at the time, but we can do it a whole lot cheaper than if you went out and called, you know, one of the big guys. So we'll do it, you know, we'll basically, we'll do it at cost. We'll just get it done, mm -hmm. but we have them pay for that. But that's, that's a nice little, you know, way to do it that way. So, but we've always done it as a rehab. And if we're going to do the rehab anyway, we're going to catch a lot of the stuff that the FHA is going to, except for something like a chimney yeah. that always sticks out a chimney. But if it needs a roof, we're going to get roof it. If it needs windows, it's going to get windows, you know, if they're, you know, stuff like that. But that's the, that's the big buzz right now. It's a nice way if you're, if you're can't quite, if there isn't enough spread to do a wholesale or a fix and flip, it's a, it's a nice, another tool in your belt, I guess. Yeah. Another thing that I'm hearing since I heard from my mentor, I don't know if this is 100% ethical. If you're asking if it's ethical or not, it probably is not, but there are wholesalers who are saying we like to do the repairs for the incoming buyer so that's why we mark it up for this price to include these certain items that we would do after the closing you know, i was just like well it, See, because you yeah. you you get a discount when it comes to doing kitchens or this mm -hmm. or that because you do rehab at scale so we're able to work those prices in for our incoming buyer so we can give the, yeah. these additional bonuses but like i don't want to get into the habit of lying to sellers no, nah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, there's definitely no need not. to do that. that. See, that's why I like doing the repairs. And a lot of people are teaching, don't do that if you're used to just doing straight up wholesales. But for us, we can justify the spread by doing, you know, repairs at cost, mm -hmm. you know, not at cost, but at a discount. Obviously, if a homeowner calls, you know, one of the big guys to do a roof, it's going to cost twice as much. So they're in their mind, they're saying, okay, well, I can agree to a lesser price because I'm going to pay 20000 where it might cost me 10000 So that's where I can build in that spread. So I feel more co very comfortable, and it's an easier sell if those repairs are needed. We had somebody who needed this amount of money. It was a house in North Wilmington, a four-bedroom colonial. She needed X. You know, I, could, I can give you X money. No, I need X. Um, but I can wait. I just have to have it before December 31st. That's when I have a note. I, she had to pay her boss off who loaned her money for the house. So the timing wasn't the issue. The price was the issue. So this was perfect for this partnership, what I call partnership or innovation. I said, okay, we can get you X, but this was like in August. We can't get you X today, but we can get you X before um, New Year's Eve, you know. 
and we were able to do that. And she was super happy. You know, she was willing to wait to pay off this note that her boss had given her. Um, she didn't need it today. She needed it then. So those are fun, fun strategies. You just got to put on, how can you just got to think, how can I creatively solve their problem? Where if you just, I mean, I've done so many deals where people just walk in, you know, look at the house. Okay. I can give you, you know, 120 cash. That's it. You know, and they, they, they didn't solve the problem. They didn't take the time to learn what the problem is. Yeah. And they lost the deal. Can you talk to us a little bit about how your mindset has shifted over the course of your career? And where do you think you have room left to grow in your mindset? Um, oh, plenty of room. Always growing. I'll be, you know, I'm a junkie for, you know, personal development. And, you know, uh, I just... a uh, just devour podcasts and, and, and reading and, you know, um, so I definitely have room for growth. Um, you know, there's always fears, you know, and, you know, keeping you from expanding. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm tackling those, you know, trying to scale my business and hiring more, more people. We have virtual assistants, we have two local, one full-time employee, but, you know, it's just, overcoming that mentality that, you know, do you really deserve this, you know, and that's something everybody has to overcome and deal with and taking, you know, taking risks to, to scale and expand your business. One of the things, you know, that I, and I guess I'm a perfectionist or it might be a little bit of OCD where I can do it. I can do it better than this person. I can do it, but that's not the best use of my time. And that's one of the hardest things because it's like, all right, I can do this task. It'll take me 20 minutes but I'm doing it like once a week and I just need to sit down and force myself to document and document how to uh, do it and then teach so I can teach someone else to do that. But sometimes like uh, that'll take me two hours. I can just get it done in 20 minutes. But in the long run, it's 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 hurting me. So those are the things that I'm doing right now is we're, you know, with technology, we can document it with, you know, videos and written procedures and policies that pull me away from these things to work on my business, not in my business. And, um, so that's just, you know, it's a little, uh, it's overwhelming sometimes, but it's, it's so paramount, so crucial to, to get that done. Um, so those are some of my struggles right now is getting that done, but working on it. So <laughs> where is your business right now? And like, what's, where are you trying to scale towards? Well, I mean, when I, you know, um, when I look at a property, there's, you know, three main exit strategies. I mean, you could subdivide it to innovation or wholesale and stuff like that. But is it, is this something I'm going to keep? Is this something I'm going to fix and flip? Or is this something I'm going to wholesale to another investor? So, you know, that those are my three main strategies that we decide. So when I look at a property, I'm never sure what I'm going to do. But, you know, those are the three legs of my business, basically. Um, um, I have uh, an employee's full time and half of her time is spent managing all of our rental properties. And the other half is she's like the front end kind of dealing with acquisitions. Um, I would like to expand that to a full time position. Um, uh, we do have, uh, you know, and she handles a lot of other aspects of, you know, of that I have another local employee who works part time and then I have several virtual assistants in the Philippines who work for us also. So we're just kind of expanding that um to um I also handle the dispositions which in the last couple of years has been pff, a breeze to tighten nothing against you disposition managers but you know that that process has been really easy uh for for me um so, you know, that's where we're expanding, you know, I'm going to be, um, moving towards full-time acquisition people and taking myself out of that and see if they can actually close the deal right now I, I get everything set up for me and then I, I close it. So because I only have 24 hours in a day, it's kind of held me back a little bit. So that's what I'm working on now. Yeah. I see, um, uh your videos oh, or yeah. your pictures on Instagram of you at the beach. You like to go down and Dewey, hang yeah. out a lot. We go, yeah, we go. Um, uh, my family has a house in Fenwick Island. Um, my girlfriend's parents have a house in ocean city, New Jersey. So we're blessed. We can 
we got different places we can go. And then always, I used to work down in, in Dewey and we always, we, we'll rent and get, uh, down there. That's more the fun beach down there. But yeah, that's, it's always been my, my fun place to go. Yeah. So it looks like you're trying to work towards the direction of building a lifestyle type of business. So in like a perfect world, what will your business look like? What will your dream lifestyle be? Well, you know, I, I feel I'm blessed because I do love this business. It's fun. You yeah, know, it it, really it's is. like a hobby. I don't ever see myself retiring because I've seen people retire. You know, oh, you know, I see so many people are like, oh, you can outsource everything and you'll you, you'll never have to do anything and have truly passive income. And I'm like, man, that's that's a recipe because I see more. so many people fall apart. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that you know, rentals or buy and hold or passive. It's not passive. Well, I'll give it an, I'll, I'll, I'll outsource everything to a property manager. Well, you need to manage the property manager, you know, because if you to totally take your hands off everything, um, you know, things are going to fall apart. I guarantee. I mean, the people that I follow are, uh, you know, are, are working incredible hours. So whenever I think, oh, I'm working too much, I'll look at one of my mentors, Pace Morby, who's just has more energy than anybody I can see. And he, cause he, cause he loves giving back and he loves working. So I don't ever see myself just sitting on an island doing nothing. I think I'd go crazy. I'd get bored really easy. I'd, I'd, I'd end up well, like watching TV too much, you know, just creating bad habits. Cause I see people that have retired and they lose, they lose that sparkle in their eye. You know, I want to always stay on top of new technologies and things and, you know, I didn't grow up with, we didn't grow up with computers. We didn't have cell phones when I was a kid. And, um, so I've kind of really, um, take, you know, learned to, you know, follow into these new technologies and I've really embraced, you know, Instagram and TikTok and, and YouTube shorts. And, um, so I'm, you know, for now on, I'm like, what a new technology. All right, where, where do I sign up? How do I do it? So I really enjoy it. It's fun doing the videos. It's fun networking, and stuff like that. Got to meet you guys, come here and do stuff like that. So I don't know if I really have a, you know, I would like to definitely take, you know, take a step back, um, start, you know, living off the rentals, um, maybe scale back and, and have more partnerships where, okay, we got the deal. You, you know, you manage the fix and flip, but, um, I enjoy the business. So I don't ever see myself completely retiring and moving to the South of France, you know, maybe, you know, take off a couple months here and there and go down to Florida or something in the winter, but uh, I, I think it keeps you, keeps your brain sharp if you're, if you're doing stuff and learning and, uh, and if you enjoy it, why not? You know, I'm, I'm blessed. I don't have a nine to five job where I'm working a, a, as in a plant somewhere where you're just, I mean, I, I do know people that are my age and they're like already counting down to retirement. And I'm like, man, I'm just getting started. You know, things are just taking off. I'm excited. And they're like, well, I got three more years. At the, I mean, I just heard a person today getting ready to retire, talking about retiring. I'm like, nah, it's too, too much fun, too exciting, too much, too many things to do. No, that's really, really good. So what is like the bigger picture of everything? You know how like 80% of the actions that you do produce 20% of the results, 20% of the actions you do produce 8%, like in a, what would you be doing with your 20% of the time that produces 8% of the, um, the results for your organization and like for your life? What is it like now or what should it be? <laughs> yeah. What is it now? And then what should it be? Well, I mean, um, you know, two, two of the books that, you know, um, I love and I've gotten a lot out of are the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. I don't know if you guys have read yeah. that. Um, you know, it's the fallacy of, oh, you becoming East is for entrepreneur. Is you thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. And really all you are is an operator and you're working in your business. I think he was the first person to coin the phrase working on your business instead of in your business. So I'm still doing too much in your business instead of working on your business. Uh, the other book I really like is the um, four hour work week. But, um, and, and that's, actual and more practical things on how to outsource and, you know, do that. So I'm, I'm definitely working way too much in my business, um, instead of working on it. So it's, it's, it's a struggle every day to take time away. And I think it's all about blocking your day out, uh, blocking your schedule and dedicating time to do some of these things that you're not going to see, uh, initial benefits from, but it's something that'll create, you know, more, 
long term. So those are the things I'm working on to build systems, to scale, to, to outsource so I can, you know, I think you, you do it and then you teach someone, you know, so um, that's what I'm working on more and more right now um, to, to outsource myself and take, you know, I've heard, you've probably seen those things where you should write down every single job in your business. Mm -hmm. And right now, if you're a one, one man or a one woman show, you put your name in every single all the hats. box. Yeah. You know, me, 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 me. And if you put that on a piece of paper or a computer, you know, a some, lucid chart or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, get a big, bl get a whiteboard. I think that'll really like set in like, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff I'm doing. And then your goal is maybe every day, just remove me and put one person in there. And if you, you know, how to eat the elephant one bite at a time. So if you, if you, if you look at it like, oh my gosh, I got to get away from all those things, you'll get overwhelmed and get frustrated. But if you just try to do one thing a week or one thing a day uh, and just eliminate that so you can be more productive and do more, you know, really ultimately should be doing things that are revenue producing things. I mean, you know, I, I definitely got rid of all my tools. I mean, years ago, you know, if there was a turnover or something needed, I was doing it. So that's the first thing you got to do. You know, I, I heard a guy who told me like sell your you know for people that were like started off as contractors a lot of people start off in this business as contractors and then they want to say they they do some flips for somebody and they're like well i can do this mm -hmm. and then the, you know what the person had taught me was you know sell your sell your tools and sell your pickup truck so if you don't have any tools and you don't have a pickup truck you know you can't go to home depot and go get the cabinets or go get the roofing shingles you know so i'm definitely done that i i haven't done that for a long time so that's one of the things you definitely don't want to be doing. And plus, you can't do it as well. I mean, I used to try to do the drywall on my first couple of properties, oh, no. and it's I was good, good, but it would take me a week. And a drywaller would come, guys that come in and they're done like in an hour. And I'm like, sand it, dry it, sand it, come back three days later, you know. So there's people that are experts on doing that. I'm not going to try to figure out how to, I've never been able to figure out how to do a three way switch correctly. You know, I, I don't need to know how to I have an electrician who does that, you know. So um, those are the things you definitely got to got to work on. And uh, it's a pro it's in progress, but it's improving every day. Yeah. So what's your vision? If you were to go source out employees, bring people on board to your team, what type of lifestyle are you trying to sell in terms of result or impact that you're trying to make? So if you're trying to pitch your vision to other people to join you on board with your mission? What is that vision? Um, hmm, interesting question. Uh, I'm not really trying to sell anything, <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm always trying to sell something. We're always trying to sell something, <laughs> whether well, it's for why, money or not. Maybe, maybe see if I understand what you're saying. This is what, what can I say to people? Why would they want to Why would they want me? to join you? Yeah, okay. That's a better way to look at it. What, you know, I, as, as a, a leader and an entrepreneur, you have to be inspiring. You have to inspire people and you want to help them grow. And, you know, you, you just don't want employees. You want people that can grow with you. So your job is to set the tone and set an environment that's exciting and see growth. I mean, we just have seen since the pandemic how many people are just disillusioned and are quitting. They just, you know, see things dead end. So you, that's your job to uh, create an environment that people can grow. And in this industry, it is better than anything else where, you know, if, you, if you're an acquisition manager or your dispositions or if you're going to have an in-house property manager that you – show the growth, how this, what's the vision of the company? This is what we want to do. How many, you know, doors do we want to have, or this is where we want to be in a certain amount of years. And if you help me reach that goal, this is what's in it for you. So, you know, it's more than just financial, you know, it, it has to be a good working environment and be, um, you know, listen to your, listen to the people to see what they want to see if you can craft something for them. I mean, um, we're, I had an office years and years ago, and then we got rid of it because partly because the financial crisis was like, I got to cut every penny, you know, no more HBO and no more this, no more that, you know, and get rid of this office. I don't need it. Um, so now everybody works from home and with technology today, it's easy, but I have people that, you know, I have a, one employee who's been with me for 10 years and she loves that ability that she can work from home. She had young children 
and flexibility, you know, so finding out what people want and seeing if you can help them get reach their goals by working with you so you can do that together. So, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to do is find people who are excited, who want to learn and 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 teach people cuz eventually people are going to go out and build their own business and and that's that's fine. I mean, you don't want to hold people back because if you do that, they're never going to want people aren't going to want to join you. I mean, people are going to move on. So, you know, you just got to create that atmosphere that people are excited to work and see the growth. Yeah, for sure. Josh, you have any last things you want to talk to Bob about? Who, uh, we, we meant to ask him this, who edits your videos and chooses the music? <laughs> uh, I have a virtual assistant okay. in the Philippines and she's amazing. And I'm like, oh, you know, uh, Biggie Smalls. All right, cool. You know, I, <laughs> so I, I she's guess the one, she's the one choosing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's chooses everything. Um, I see. Typical me. I was like, the first time we met, I was like so overwhelmed, like ah, you know, trying to create a thing. So now we have a goal where, um, we do one video a day. She works for me for four hours a day. Okay. Uh, so she we create one. We created a um. We created an outro mm -hmm. that, you know, does a, f and she came up with all this stuff. So it just flashes my name and then all my, my Instagram handle, which is at Bob Warburton. And my TikTok is at Bob Warburton and my <laughs> YouTube shorts just search for Bob Warburton. And then we also go to Facebook and a lot of people are sleeping on Facebook, but Facebook is bigger than all that stuff combined. Yeah. If you want to reach old people like me, mm -hmm. that's where we're all hanging out still. But, um, so, you know, it took some struggle and she came up with some ideas and so now it's really automated. I created just like a, um, an Excel spreadsheet where I just create a calendar. So we were like trying to get stuff down. So now we've got it mapped out like three works, three weeks worth of stuff. And I have a schedule and a lot of stuff we're chopping up and we can get four or five videos out of it. So, and we'll just like do one of those a week. So we've got a schedule. She does that. Now there, what's nice for the East coast and the Philippines is they're exactly 12 hours different from us. So it's really easy. Whenever I'm talking to my VAs, I'll say at 12, you know, I don't need to see PM or AM because whatever it is for me, they're the opposite, you know? So, um, so we try to get, I try to get that done. I'm giving her more authority to do stuff and she picks the music and she comes up with crazy. It's funny because I just think, oh, it's America. I didn't think she would understand, but she's catching like movie references, music references, putting little clips of things in there. And I'm just like, it's amazing. I would, I would, a perfect example. If I tried to do that, mm -hmm. which was something I was thinking about doing, yeah. it's like, you know, one of the best things is, you know, you know, I've learned is who, not how, you know, so find someone who can do it instead of me learning how to do it. You know, oh, I, if this was two years ago, I would have bought the editing software and do all that. So, I mean, she comes up with, you know, funny things and, and, you know, makes fun of me and them and, and that you got to laugh, you know, and, and, you know, laugh at yourself. And I'm like, this is great. You know, so she does a super job on that. We're editing testimonials from sellers and stuff like that. But so our job is just to post one thing a day. I'm a big fan of Gary V. I mean, he's, you know, he's like posting, you know, wherever you're posting, you should be posting 10 times that. But so we just set a goal. We have a schedule and we do it every day. And now it's pretty automatic. Like we do mine in the morning and we're down to like 10 or 15 minutes because she knows what I like mm -hmm. and I trust her. And eventually I think I'll be at the point where I'm just here it is, roll with it, you know? Um, but um, yeah, so I found a pretty good, I was given a referral from, from somebody and, and she does an amazing job with it. Yeah, that's really cool. Do you have any advice for anyone looking to get started in real estate? Um, well, I mean, it's, you, you, I think, you know, you've got to love what you do. And I've heard some people say you don't have to, you could just do something. You don't have to love what you do. You know, does the guy who is on a trash truck love what he did? Well, no. And that's probably he wishes or she wishes they were doing something else. But I really love this business because it is more, it, we're not really in the real estate business. We're in the marketing business. So ultimately real estate is the vehicle. I mean, the guy who, who has a shoe store is not in the shoe business. He's in the marketing business of selling shoes. So I revolve, uh, you know, I go back to, I was a marketing major, so I've always enjoyed it. So I think first of all, you, you got to like it. I think people that are like, this is the, the hottest thing. They were into crypto last year and now they're in the wholesaling, 
you know, maybe they're into Amazon drop shipping. I think you got to find something that you really, you really got to like it. Um, you know, meet somebody, hook up with you guys, contact me, you know, reach out, hit us in the DMs, um, you know, to find somebody. There's so much out there now. We were talking earlier when I got started, it was like cassette tapes and CDs and you spend all this money. There's so much stuff on YouTube and podcasts that you can learn. Um, pick one niche and stick with it. You know, we were talking about, you really got to have a lot of, uh, creative innovations, fix and flip wholesale, all that, that can get really overwhelming when you're new. I would pick one strategy, master it, and then move on. Um, one marketing source. If you're just going to do bandit signs, be the best bandit sign person. So just get one thing. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, and then net network. I mean, my mentor Pace Morby's thing is called squat up and that, you know, means basically networking, come to events, come to Jesse's next event. When is that? It's tonight. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tonight. tonight. It's tonight. Well, it was yesterday yeah. when you saw it. Wait for the next yeah. one, you know, go to that, um, you know, look for local Rias. Um, um, but the best thing is, you know, people are, oh, can I buy you lunch? Can I pick your brain? Bring value to people. You know, what can I do for you? It's not what can I get from you? Mm -hmm. What can I do for you? You know, bring it, you know, go out and find some deals and bring it to somebody. And then you can partner up and learn. I've had several people bring me deals. We learn together. And, you know, and, and, that, and then eventually they're going to go out on their own. I know they're not going to be a bird dog or a property scout for me forever, but I'm like, Hey, you bring the deal to me. You're not going to make as much as if you did it yourself, but if you did it yourself, you probably wouldn't have got it done. Come along. If we're doing the fix and flip, come along if we're doing the wholesale, see it, see the whole process. And eventually you can do it yourself. So take action, talk to people and, um, and just keep, keep, keep going, keep following up. Thanks a lot for all the value today, Bob. Yeah, we really appreciate you. it. Cool. I'm sure all the newbies who are listening to this podcast can take a lot away from you. We feel your energy that you're just such a giver. I really appreciate you coming out to my house and talking to us. Very cool setup you guys got here. I'm yeah. I was taking notes. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, taking notes from you too. Nah, it's just like, oh my goodness. Like, no, nah, this is, a, you guys can't see from behind here. This is a very impressive setup. I was like, what kind of lights you guys are using? I mean, this is cool. Yeah. You could toss money at the problem. It'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's That's fun. what I learned. Yeah. It's fun. Hey, listen, this is your. This is kind of a hobby for you guys too, though. I mean, it's work, yeah. but it's a hobby. It's better than going bl blowing money on some stupid hot rod or something. something oh, 100%. Silly. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still fun, but it's you're investing in yourself. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you're out there, you want to look me up. Like I said, the best way is catch me on Instagram. Uh, at Bob Warburton, W-A-R-B-U-R-T-O-N. Thanks, guys. Non-Genius Podcast. Peace. Peace.